Imagine yourself at a company where you're not only encouraged to pursue your passions outside of work, but also given the time and opportunities to do so during work hours. Sound too good to be true? At Patagonia, a top tier outdoor clothing and gear company, this dream becomes a reality. At Patagonia, employees can catch waves during their lunch breaks thanks to their CEO's innovative let my people go surfing policy. Rose Macario, the company's trailblazing CEO, has encouraged her staff to embrace their passions outside of work by allowing them time to take breaks for outdoor activities, like surfing, hiking, or spending quality time with the family. This isn't some fantasy, it's a reality at Patagonia, where work-life balance is taken to a whole new level. The company goes the extra mile with on-site childcare, flexible work hours, and generous paid parental leave. The result, a fiercely loyal workforce and incredibly low turnover rates. Today, we're gonna to explore the concept of work-life balance. The pandemic has shaken up the way we work. And as more of us shifted to remote work, the line between our professional and personal lives has become fuzzier. But this work-life balance conundrum isn't just the product of COVID-19. It's been in the making for quite some time. The rise of women in the workplace has caused a shift in traditional gender roles. Now it's more common for both parents to be juggling work and family responsibilities. And let's not forget our aging population. With more people retiring and needing care, many working folks find themselves in the caregiver role too. The Australian Bureau of Statistics has estimated that one in eight employed Australians are also responsible for providing care, such as for an elderly parent. The job market is also evolving. Job security is dwindling and temporary gigs are on the rise. Younger generations are less attached to the idea of a lifelong commitment to one organization. They're more free-spirited and interested in new opportunities and experiences. With remote work and telecommuting becoming the norm, we're granted flexibility, but also face the expectation of being on 24-7. It's a double-edged sword that makes it hard to switch off and find that elusive balance. COVID-19 may have brought these work-life balance issues to the forefront, but they've been simmering for quite some time. What are we gonna to discuss today? We'll start by exploring various theories that shed light on the complex dynamics between work and personal life, including spillover theory, the role strain hypothesis, and conservation of resources theory. We'll also look at the brighter side of the coin with concepts like work family enrichment and role enhancement. From there, we'll shift our focus to discussing personal strategies to cultivate work-life balance, like boundary management and recovery techniques, both beyond and within the workday. Finally, we'll consider what organizations can do to foster work-life balance among their employees. Early thinking on work-life balance focused on this concept of spillover, which is how experiences in one role, like being a worker, might affect or spill over into another role, such as being a partner, a parent, or a caregiver. Picture a construction worker who has had a tough day dealing with delays on the job site, and then they come home and find it hard to unwind and be present with their family. That's spillover in action. It's important to note that spillover is a two-way street. Experiences at work can affect our home life, but your home life can also affect your work life. And this process can manifest as direct or indirect spillover. Direct spillover occurs when work-related tasks intrude into your personal life. Imagine our construction worker having to answer calls from their supervisor during a family dinner. Indirect spillover, on the other hand, involves carrying emotions from one role to another. For example, exhaustion from a physically demanding job might lead to irritability at home. Well, we've mentioned some negative spillover examples. There's also positive spillover, a sense of accomplishment from completing a challenging project at work, like our construction worker successfully finishing a complex job, can boost their mood at home, and similarly, positive experiences at home can enhance their work life. The role strain hypothesis, sometimes called role strain theory or the resource strain model, helps to explain the spillover hypothesis, illustrating how demands in one domain can affect health and performance in another. The role strain hypothesis posits that we all have limited resources, such as time, energy, and attention, which we use throughout the day and different roles place demands on these resources. Spending a large chunk of our resources on one role may strain the resources available for other roles. Consider our construction worker, let's call them Ravi. Ravi's role at the construction site demands physical energy, mental focus, and a significant chunk of time. 
These are all limited resources that Robbie has to spend judiciously throughout their day. When a demanding project at work requires Robbie to work overtime, their resources are further depleted, leaving less energy and time for their roles outside of work as a parent, a spouse, and a community member. Typically, we have enough resources to meet the needs of our different roles, but strain occurs when the demands of these roles exceeds the resources we have available. Let's say during an intense period at work, Ravi is working longer hours and the physically grueling work leaves them exhausted. This heavy demand from their work role starts to impair Ravi's ability to function in their other roles. They might be too tired to help the kids with their homework or spend quality time with their spouse. The role strain hypothesis aligns with the spillover theory, but adds another layer by outlining the mechanism driving this process, our limited resources. The theory also takes into account the value or importance we place on our different roles. Strain surfaces when our ability to perform in a role doesn't match our desired standard of performance. For example, if Robbie is less invested in the job, working only to pay the bills, they might not feel strained even if their home life is demanding more of their time and attention. However, if Ravi deeply cares about their work performance and the quality of the construction projects, they're more likely to feel strained in that situation. It's interesting to note that the role strain hypothesis mainly focuses on the negative outcomes of strain, whereas spillover theory considers both positive and negative aspects. Early theories, such as the role strain hypothesis, really emphasize the darker side of juggling multiple roles. They focus on the concept of work-family conflict, which occurs when the pressures from work and family are mutually incompatible, making it difficult to participate in one role due to involvement in the other. The emphasis on conflict highlights this tension, this incompatibility between different roles. For instance, the demands of your work role might make it challenging for you to meet the needs of your family role and vice versa. As a result, much of the literature that focuses on work-life balance emphasizes the negatives, how this conflict between roles can lead to strained relationships, poor mental health, and a lower quality of life. But what exactly causes conflict between work and life? Researchers have identified several mechanisms that can generate this friction. The first is time-based conflict. This is the most straightforward form of conflict, arising when there simply isn't enough time to effectively engage in both work and non-work roles. Long working hours, work overload, scheduling conflicts, marital status, the presence of children, and family size can all contribute to time-based conflict. For example, working long hours might interfere with your home life or caregiving commitments at home, limiting the time available for work. The second is strain-based conflict. This type of conflict emerges when emotions or preoccupations from one domain spill over into the other. So imagine being frustrated with your boss and carrying that negative mood into your home life, or worrying about your relationship with your partner or child, making it hard to focus at work. Strain-based conflict aligns with the role strain hypothesis and some aspects of spillover theory. It's that indirect form of spillover. And finally, we have behavior-based conflict. Here, behaviors that are effective in one domain become counterproductive in another. Think of a salesperson who thrives on aggression and ambition at work. These tactics might not be the best approach when parenting or nurturing relationships with their children. Remember, work-life balance is a two-way street. Just as work can impact your family life, creating what we call work-to-family conflict, your home or family life can also interfere with work, leading to what's called family-to-work conflict. Now, according to a comprehensive meta-analysis in 2011, the biggest catalyst for this conflict aren't just the demands of the job, it's also about how engrossed you are in your work. Imagine our construction worker. Maybe they're aiming to become the site supervisor, so they're putting in extra effort and time. This kind of overcommitment can tip the scales making it feel like you're investing more than you're getting back. But here's the good news, having a supportive workplace can help alleviate the strain. Maybe Ravi's boss is understanding and provides flexible hours, or maybe their colleagues help share the workload. These factors, alongside factors like job autonomy and task variety, can act as a buffer, reducing the chances of work-to-family conflict. Personality plays a role here too. Some people believe they're the master of their own fate, a trait that psychologists call an internal locust of control. 
These people tend to believe that they can influence their life events and they usually experience less conflict. But if you're the type who reacts intensely to situations, a trait psychologists call neuroticism, you might find yourself experiencing conflict more often. Now let's flip the script and talk about how family life can also interfere with work, creating family to work conflict. Turns out family to work conflict is caused by similar things. This time, however, it's not about your job's demands, but rather the demands that come from your personal life. Imagine our Ravi trying to juggle a myriad of family responsibilities along with a demanding job in construction. Think about it. Maybe they have kids who need to be picked up from school right when Ravi's in the middle of a critical task at work, or perhaps they have an elderly parent who requires care and attention, which could potentially take up significant chunks of their workday. These are classic examples of time demands from family life that could lead to family to work conflict. And then there are the family stressors. Maybe there's a disagreement about who should do what in the family, causing role conflict or ambiguity about family roles and expectations leading to confusion and frustration. These factors can intensify the conflict even further, affecting the ability to perform at work. Support or lack thereof within the family also plays a pivotal role here. Let's say Robbie's spouse is understanding and shares the family responsibilities equally. This support can act as a buffer, reducing the conflict. But if they're left to shoulder most of the responsibilities alone, it can exacerbate the conflict. And don't forget the role of personality traits here too. Just as with work to family conflict, traits like locus of control and neuroticism come into play here too. Let's talk about the fallout, the impact, or the consequences of work family conflict. Let's say Ravi is unable to strike that perfect balance between their work and family commitments. What could possibly go wrong? Unfortunately, a lot. First, Ravi's relationships might take a hit. The constant struggle to balance work and family could lead to reduced satisfaction in their relationships. And it's not just Ravi's relationship with their partner that could be affected. The tension might permeate to their kids too, leading to distress and possible mental health issues for them. Then comes the dreaded burnout. As Robbie grapples with multiple roles, they might start feeling emotionally exhausted, like they're running on a low battery because they never get a chance to recharge. The conflict might manifest physically too, leading to psychosomatic symptoms, and general health issues might crop up, and in some cases, people might even resort to substance abuse as a coping mechanism. And then of course, there's the impact on Robbie's job. Decreased job satisfaction might lead to Robbie thinking about packing up the toolbox and leaving the job, in addition, Robbie's quality of life might take a hit. Remember, a happy life is not just about a fat paycheck, but also about mental well-being. And let's not forget the kids. If Robbie is stressed, it might reflect in their kids' school performance or their behavior. So as you can see, work-family conflict doesn't just impact the individual, but the whole family unit. And all of this is not just speculation. It's backed up by research. A landmark review from the early 2000s highlighted all these potential repercussions of work-family conflict. So it's clear that finding the elusive work-life balance isn't just a luxury, it's a necessity. One common question is whether men and women experience this conflict differently. And if so, why is that? Traditionally, it's been thought that women experience more family-to-work conflict, while men are prone to work-to-family conflict. The rationale behind this belief lies in the societal roles assigned to men and women. For instance, men have historically been the primary earners of the family, so their work life spills over into their family life. Women, on the other hand, have traditionally been responsible for home and childcare, making them more susceptible to family duties encroaching on their work time. But times are changing. The traditional norms of men at work and women at home are evolving. Now, it's completely normal to see women thriving in the workplace and men actively participating in household chores. This evolution is gradually leading to more balance in roles, albeit at a slow pace. However, the research arena is not so clear cut. The studies on gender differences in work-family conflict are, let's say, a mixed bag. Surprisingly, a good chunk of research suggests that there's no significant difference in the overall level of conflict experienced by men and women but they do experience different types of conflict. But even as far back as the early 2000s, research showed that men and women equally value their family roles and the quality of their family life. 
In other words, the importance of family is not gender dependent, and both men and women strive to achieve a healthy work-life balance. Now let's take a moment to zoom out a bit and think globally. How does culture influence work-family conflict? A fascinating study from 2000 took a deep dive into this exact question. The researchers looked at managers from four different clusters of countries. An individualistic one, think countries like Australia, the US, or the UK, and three collectivist ones, hailing from Asia, Eastern Europe, and Latin America. Here's the intriguing bit. The team discovered that the individualistic clusters show the strongest correlation between high work demands and what they called strain-based work-family conflict. So in these individualistic societies, people often found that intense work demands significantly hampered their ability to function effectively in their family roles, more so than in collectivist cultures. You're probably thinking, why is that? One theory is that folks in these individualistic cultures might be more driven by achievement and therefore place greater emphasis on work. Moreover, there might be less societal support available in individualistic cultures to help handle those hefty work demands. Recall our earlier discussion about the job demands control and support model. It's crucial to remember how support can be a game changer when it comes to reducing stress from demanding jobs. Another crucial finding from this study was the ripple effect of work-family conflict. If you're grappling with this conflict, chances are your job satisfaction might plummet, and you might start contemplating a job change. And this relationship is even stronger in individualistic cultures. So to sum it up, in individualistic societies, both the propensity for work-family conflict due to demanding jobs and the negative fallout of such conflict seems to be more pronounced. Not exactly a rosy picture, but remember that understanding these dynamics is the first step towards addressing them.